Hello and welcome to Ozpol Explained. I am your curly-haired host, as always, David, named after the biblical king himself. And that fun fact is relevant to what we'll be talking about today. Kings. Monarchy. What, what is that? Yep, I'm going to be talking about how Australia is a constitutional monarchy. What that means, right? Does the king actually have any power? Does the monarchy do anything? Can the monarchy do anything if they want to? Well, I'm going to answer all those questions and also examine how those answers have evolved over time. A lot of people think that, you know, the monarch doesn't really do much. And that's kind of true, but oversimplified. While the king or queen doesn't personally have an active hand in the day-to-day -day of Australia's political system, it is a role that is pretty central, right? It's kind of like the central axis to which everything else revolves around. There are royal powers, and some of them are used pretty regularly, and some just haven't been touched in decades, and some only really exist in paper because they've never been used in Australia's federal history. In this episode, I'm going to go over the constitutional powers of the monarchy, the role of the Governor General and Governors as the representative of the monarch, and how the use of these powers has changed over the years. Quick note, in the future, if we become a republic, all of this is going to be outdated and irrelevant. So quick, share this before 200 years of Australian history just becomes no longer relevant. To begin with, the King of the United Kingdom is automatically the King of Australia. Currently, that's King Charles III. There's a collection of 15 countries called the Commonwealth Realms, which include places that were formerly parts of the British Empire like Canada and New Zealand and the Solomon Islands, Jamaica, and also, you know, Australia. That's us. So whoever is the British monarch is also the monarch of all those other places at the same time. This means many things, right? Like big picture stuff, because that person is the head of state of several countries, but it's also all the way down to like, whose portrait is on the back of every single coin. So for example, in Australia, Queen Elizabeth II's face is on everything from the five cent coin all the way up to the regular $2 gold coin, or even one of the official 20th anniversary special commemorative 99.9% .9 silver Shrek coins that were minted by the Perth Royal Mint and is a collector's item that is technically worth $2 as a coin in terms of legal value, but costs $165 to buy. Yes, that is a real coin. It has actually got a real face value of $2 and you can actually legally use it to buy ice cream if you really wanted to give someone a massive headache. Don't do that. But anyway, on a more serious note, the monarch is woven into our constitution, to the very foundations of it. The constitution establishes the foundations of how our government and parliament works, like the power to make laws. Section 1 of the constitution states that the legislative power of the commonwealth shall be vested in a federal parliament which shall consist of the queen, a senate, and a house of representatives. Yeah, it's right at the start. It's like the opening crawl of Star Wars, only the word the Queen bursts onto the screen as dramatic music plays. The Queen is mentioned 47 times and her representative, the Governor General, is mentioned 65 times in the Constitution, while the Prime Minister is mentioned zero times. Not at all. You can see what I mean by being woven into it. By Queen, I of course mean one of the longest reigning monarchs ever in British history, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria not only signed the constitution into effect, but she also created the position of the Governor General of Australia, a person who is appointed by the monarch to act on their behalf. Executive power is vested in the monarch, but exercised by the Governor General. But what do I mean by executive power? Well, basically, the decisions of Parliament are made official by the Governor General. So a quick breakdown of the Governor General's job, right? They're in charge of a lot of important things. So they are the ones who issue writs for general elections and by-elections. That is a thing that officially makes an election happen. After an election, before a senator or a member can actually serve in Parliament, they must swear an oath of allegiance or affirmation to the monarch which they do before the Governor-General. 
The Governor General also then appoints the Prime Minister who recommends who to be in the Cabinet, which the Governor General then also appoints and swears in. And if no party has a majority, the Governor General decides who gets to be the government, right? They resolve that sort of issue if there's any problems. So then these members, after swearing allegiance to the monarch, then debate and discuss what bills should become a law. But they can't just make it a law just by themselves. There is the final step of once it's been approved by the two chambers, it's given to the Governor General for royal assent. Now you may have noticed a little subtle hint in the term royal assent that the monarch is involved in this process. Again, it's very subtle, but I will unpack it for you. Remember how I said legislative power is made up of three parts, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the Queen? Well, it's because of this that you can't create a law without the agreement of all three of those sections. Now, the Governor General, in the absence of the monarch, is the one who is giving that final agreement, that royal assent, to make it a law. Now, King Charles III, he's not going to get on a plane and fly around doing paperwork for every single parliament in all the countries of the Commonwealth realms, because that's so much, right? So, the Governor General's job is to do endless paperwork on his behalf. Endless paperwork, yay! It's just like being an adult. Only the Governor General gets to hang out with princes and princesses, and it's not make-believe. They actually get to do that. Without this signature to represent royal assent, then a bill passed by Parliament just does not become a law. Fun fact, the Governor General does not have to give royal assent. Fun fact, I don't always use the preface fun fact appropriately. The Governor General actually has four different options when presented with a bill, and they reserve their right and discretion to choose which one it is. One, sign the bill into law in the name of the monarch. Two, refuse to sign the bill at all. Three, reserve the bill to be signed by the monarch personally. And four, send the bill back with some proposed amendments to which the parliament then has to figure out what to do with. To be clear, the governor general almost always signs the bill into law. That is by far the most used option. The governor general has never refused this outright. However, the other options have happened. There have been times where a bill has been reserved for the monarch's personal signature or returned to parliament with proposed amendments. This is quite rare. There's like a little over a dozen bills that have had their signature reserved for the king or queen, with the last one being in 1975. And also just around about a dozen bills have been sent back by the Governor General with proposed amendments, the last one being in 1985. Parliament has almost always agreed with those proposed amendments, and then that bill has received royal assent, with the exception of one. One bill. There was a Governor General called Lord Northcote who at one point decided, no, I'm not going to sign this customs tariffs bracket British preference close bracket bill of 1906. Thrilling, I know. So he sent it back with amendments and the Senate just disagreed with them, did not like them. And well, they sent it back and the Governor General decided, well, instead of refusing to sign it, I'm just going to leave it up to the King to make his decision. The King did not sign it. Parliament passed a bill and it did not become a law because the King did not sign it. Here's the thing though, the monarch can still even undo laws that have been given royal assent anyway. This is the kind of thing that makes people go, wait, what? Is that real? Can the king just like sit on his throne and go, royal decree, I don't like that, it's no more. Well, no, but yeah. So section 59 of the constitution says that the monarch can disallow a law given royal assent by the governor general up to one year after it has passed, which means after that the governor general then has to go back to parliament and announce that, sorry y'all, the big man says no, at which point the law is annulled. It is undone and no more. And if you've never heard of this, it's probably because it's never happened in Australia's federal history. However, 
It has happened elsewhere, including Australia's states in pre-Federation and also in other countries that were colonised by the British. For example, two bills were refused royal assent by the Governor of Victoria in the 1850s and another one was disallowed in the 1860s. Governors, by the way, are the state version of a Governor General and represent the monarch in the individual state parliaments. So imagine them as pretty similar. The power of disallowance is something that was written into the constitution of many British colonies to ensure that the British government, who advises the monarch, still had legislative control over those colonies. Laws that were considered repugnant to England, no matter how far away that they were made, could be undone. New Zealand, for example, in the 1800s had many attempts to make laws that were refused, royal assent, or even had that royal assent retracted and disallowed after the fact. Also in the Middle Ages, right, it was a genuine concern that the king would refuse royal assent if he did not like the decisions of the English Parliament. However, when this power of disallowance was written into the Australian Constitution and came into effect in 1901, the practice of using it in the colonies was actually pretty rare at that point. So why has this power never been used federally? The answer, convention. Convention, by the way, is a set of unwritten ideas that people have agreed to follow over time. They're not the same as laws, but people go along with them because that is the tradition and way that things run. But how did we get these conventions? Well, they developed over time in the British Parliament and were passed down to us, like a couch wrapped in plastic, like a family heirloom. You could take the plastic off that, but it's to protect it and your great grandma will be very annoyed with you if you do. But how did we get this particular convention of non-intervention? Well, let me introduce you to another C word, conferences. Yeah, it's really adult now, huh? The Imperial Conferences of 1926 and 1930 told Britain that we'd like some independence, please. Remember at the start when I said the King of Australia and the King of the United Kingdom are like the same person? Well, those are considered technically separate entities. So when Charles is acting as the King of Australia, he's acting in Australian interests on the advice of Australian ministers and parliament. And even though he's the same physical human man, when he's acting as the British king, he's acting in British interests on the advice of British ministers and parliament. Think of him like a matryoshka nesting doll with several crowns buried deep inside of him. But a hundred years ago, the monarch acted only on the advice of the British government and the governor general was appointed not just to represent the king or queen, but the British government as well. So leaders of various governments from British dominions got together for imperial conferences every few years to discuss their living situation, remind each other of the chore charts and talk about how, you know, like they'd like to be able to make their own laws and stuff without Britain breathing down their neck. In 1926, the Prime Ministers of Canada, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand went, hey, what if, get this, right? We all agree that we are all equal and should be allowed to make our own rules as we want. The Balfour Declaration was written, which basically says that all the British dominions were of equal status and autonomous communities, not subordinates to the United Kingdom. When the Imperial Conference had its reunion tour in 1930, they all got together and went, yeah, no, we still actually like this idea. And the Statute of Westminster of 1931 was written. That made it so the Parliament of the UK would not legislate in regards to the other Commonwealth countries without the consent of those countries. We got a little bit of independence, yay! Australia would go on to get even more independence from the UK in the 1980s, but I'll get into that later. So the monarch chooses the governor general to represent them, but instead of them wildly throwing a dart blindfolded at a bunch of portraits of English aristocrats to put on a boat and ship them to Australia, they ask advice from the government of the day who would be a good pick. Before 1931, this meant that the British government went, hey, 
I think this guy would do a great job, your highness. And being a constitutional monarch, right, instead of having all the power absolute to themselves, they act on advice of ministers. Which means in this case, by convention, they go, ah yes, I accept that nomination, good work, Sir Hotherington Albert Smithington III. Yes. But 1931 onwards, that convention shifted to listening to the governments of the countries themselves, which King George V did not like. He just was not a fan of that change. He made it known, especially that the Prime Minister at the time recommended Sir Isaac Isaacs, an Australian-born man? What? Someone actually born in the colonies to represent the king? <sighs> Ridiculous. He was grumpy about it, but the Prime Minister was the relevant advisor to the King in this matter, and he accepted that. Side note, who calls their child Isaac Isaacs? Did his parents want him to get bullied? Even though convention is technically not a rule and will not be able to legally stop the King from exercising his rights to use Section 59 of the Constitution, it's inconceivable that it would be used. There is almost no way in the future that it will be. But if it did happen, for whatever reason, it would be entirely constitutional, legal, and it could not be legislated away. That is not a power that you could remove from the king unless we held a referendum to either remove section 59 entirely or to have a referendum to become a republic and remove the monarch from our constitution entirely. There is, however, a piece of legislation that has reduced the monarch's influence and powers, but mostly for the states. Cast your mind back to 1986, hairspray sales were through the roof, Disney released The Great Mouse Detective, and I had yet to be born for another six years, and for the tenth time, Queen Elizabeth II was visiting Australia, this time to personally sign a bill known as the Australia Acts of 1986 into law. I say acts, plural, because she'd also personally signed another piece of legislation that was nearly identical passed by the Parliament of the UK. That meant that the two would come into effect at the same time. This was just to make sure that there was no ambiguity in its legal force. Basically, a few things were achieved by this bill. One, Britain could no longer legislate for any part of Australia, and states could now legislate to repeal or amend any UK legislation that extended to them. State governors were no longer representatives of the British government, but appointed directly on recommendation of the premiers of those states. And also, the monarch could no longer disallow state laws, and governors couldn't reserve royal assent for the monarch's personal approval. While the monarch can still exercise their powers while physically present in those states, they would only do so now with the agreement of the Premier. Ta-da! More independence! Though there is a quick note that it is still possible for the Governor-General and Governors to act on their discretion. They reserve the right to advise and warn the ministers of government, and also have the ability to dismiss a government. We have seen this twice in Australian history. The most famous example of this was the constitutional crisis in 1975, when Governor General John Kerr dismissed the Gough Whitlam government without consulting Gough Whitlam on the best action. The other example is in 1932, when the Governor of New South Wales dismissed Jack Lang, the Premier of New South Wales, because of a constitutional crisis as well. So while there is this trend over time where the Governor-General and Governor have become more hands-off in the legislative process, it is actually still possible for them to act on independent discretion without the advice of ministers in a crisis. So, to recap, right, the monarchy has a mixture of roles and powers that are almost entirely exercised by their representatives, the governor of each state and the governor general of the federal parliament. That involves issuing writs for elections, swearing in members of parliament, and turning bills passed by parliament 
into laws officially. While it is still constitutionally possible in theory for the king to interfere with our laws, it would be inconceivable for this to happen in the modern age. We can safely assume that the governor general or governors will use their powers of royal assent whenever parliament passes a bill and they will act on the advice and consultation of the elected government. It would be inconceivable for the monarch to even refuse the prime minister on the appointment of who next should be the governor general. So while in the past the monarchy of Australia would have independent discretion and control over our parliament, it now works more as a ceremonial and mechanical element to the functioning of Parliament. And there you have it. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've learned lots, enjoyed this episode, and please share with other people so they better understand how our system works. Thank you so much to my supporters on Patreon. Comment down below what you would like to learn about next, and I will see you next time.